Hello everyone, welcome. My name is Ashwin Joglikar and I am from Resonance PCCP division. Today I am here with a one shot video of chapter the making of a global world. So let us quickly start and complete this chapter. So this chapter is uh, from your history portion that is the making of a global world. We understand in this chapter how globalization actually took shape, right? And now uh, as a term globalization is a quite a recent term, it is not very old, but the concept existed quite uh, long back that is uh, since the silk roots. So that is all we will look at now how different flows of trade happen, capital happen, people happen from one place to another place or for different reasons. Then something related to the first and second world war and then we will wind up the chapter. So quickly uh, let us start with the chapter that is the making of a global world. Now previously or the starting point is introduction that is the pre-modern world. Now before uh, this modern world emerged or came, there was a pre-modern world that is globalization refers to a economic system that has emerged since the last 50 years or so. But making of the global world has taken place since again a long time that is has a long history of trade, of migration, of people in search of work from one place to another and that is what we see today also happening. The movement of capital that is money and much else. From ancient times travellers, traders, priests as well as pilgrims have travelled vast distances for knowledge, opportunity, spiritual fulfilment and other things or to escape persecution that is if they were being tried for uh, something in their uh, countries they would in order to uh, protect themselves used to migrate to other places. That is the making of a now uh, the pre-modern world or the making of the global world as a long history that is what we saw. Human societies have become steadily more interlinked. Now in today's generation or in today's scenario we see that we are quite interlinked as well as interdependent or interconnected with different countries of the world. That is the world has become a global village. Travellers, traders, priests and pilgrims travelled vast distances again for the search of knowledge, spiritual fulfilment and other things. They carried with them goods, money, values as well as skills, inventions and even arms and uh, even germs and diseases that is what they carry. An active coastal trade is found uh, that is the it linked the Indus Valley civilization with present day West Asia even as early as 3000 BC. Cowries or seashell have uh, been used or were used as a form of currency. Now here you can see the early stage of the old world that is Indus Valley civilization, Mesopotamia, uh, China as well as Egypt the early civilizations and how probably a coastal trade connected these places. That is we are trying to establish here again that they were also interlinked that they there was a trade which was happening between these places. Here you can see uh, the cowries or seashell which was used as a currency spread of diseases uh, that is a person carrying a disease on uh, on their own bodies migrated to some other place and other people were also affected by that disease. The pilgrims in search of spiritual fulfillment as well as now travellers and traders. Coming to the first uh, point of this topic that is silk roots link the world that is how silk roots how uh, have linked the world that is silk cargoes from China used to travel and reach Europe. Interconnected modern trade and culture links between distant parts of the world that is best example of a uh, vibrant pre-modern trade and cultural links. The name silk route is derived from uh, the cargoes that is the silk cargoes which are bound for Europe to the importance of westbound Chinese silk cargoes westbound that is towards Europe. Now uh, this existed from Christian era till 15th century Chinese pottery and other things also were uh, traded along with silk Chinese pottery textiles spices again from coming from India travel to Europe and in return precious metals were flowing from there that is from Europe they were reaching to uh, China and India. Christian missionaries that is the time uh, missionaries also helped in spreading their uh, religions that is Christian missionaries, Muslim preachers as well as Buddhism much before that had also spread from these directions. Travel this route to Asia Buddhist uh, or Buddhism emerged from Eastern India and spread to other parts of the world. Now this you can see. Uh, BC or BC and AD and CE. Okay. 
Now this again depicts the west, uh, most well known sea, silk route connected China to Europe that is you can see here from the Chinese uh, territory how they have the routes are going and connecting the Europe or connecting Europe. One route is also passing from India also and then this is like a coastal route that is through sea okay and this is given in our NCRT. All right. Next topic of this is uh, food also traveled and food also had a history. Many of the people that is what, what food we actually eat nowadays is not or was not grown here maybe centuries earlier. It came from somewhere. Now food travels that is spaghetti and potato that has a history here. Traders and travelers introduced new crops to the lands they traveled. Now the, that is traders are carrying with them these new crops uh, to the lands where they are traveling and if there is a uh, these new lands where they are reaching, they find something new, they have brought that back to their own countries. Noodles that is traveled from west, uh, traveled west from China to become spaghetti. Arab traders probably took pasta to 5th century Sicily, that is a place in Italy, and potatoes, soya, maize, groundnuts, tomatoes, chilies, all introduced in Europe and Asia after America was discovered. So, these were actually grown in America. Now, America again here is referred as both North and South America and the Caribbeans together they have referred to this as America. Europe's now poor started, they started eating potatoes as a diet because again the population was rising in Europe and as such people did not or could not have much to afford or they did not had much money to eat. So, now when uh, potato as a crop was introduced in Europe that became a lifesaver for them. That is they began to eat better and live longer with the introduction of the humble potato. That is why when a disease struck this potato uh, crop and that is what uh, led to the great, uh, great Irish potato famine and complete crops were destroyed and many uh, people because of uh, they, they were so dependent on potato that now they had to starve and many people perished because of this starvation. Now that is when disease uh, destroyed the crop, the uh, potato crop in mid 1840s in Ireland hundreds of thousands died of starvation. Now, uh, here the picture is depicting the Frederick the Great from Prussia. Now, uh, as a king he wanted to introduce this crop in his country, but actually the uh, peasants were not ready to cultivate this crop because many believed that what is grown inside the earth uh, is a devilish thing and because it is not using sunlight, so it is not that useful. So, there is a story which goes that how he actually made the farmers cultivate that is he uh, was a uh, he wanted people to start cultivating potatoes that is uh, so that it could be introduced but farmers were not ready. So what he did, he actually asked his soldiers to uh, be on, on the side of a particular field where they were doing some sowing and uh, that is these seeds. Now later when people became uh, inquisitive about what, uh, why uh, the king guards are being posted there and uh, because they thought that something valuable is uh, there. So, therefore, many of the people who were interested in looting that thing probably were also aware about that. So, when they found out that it is being actually the uh, actually what has been sown there is potato. So, now uh, later on that is how they became aware of it that okay, now this is a crop which we need to grow and that is how slowly in Europe people started cultivating this crop and that is how it became or it changed their uh, way they used to eat food. Now conquest, disease and trade, now even uh, many of the places were uh, taken over because of the disease uh, was which was spread and trade which was happening. So three points uh, are there that is America was the most favored destination for the people. In 16th century many European sailors found a sea route to Asia and America. The Portuguese and the Spanish were uh, the leading ones in this conquest and colonization of America was underway. The most powerful weapon of these people of the Spanish conquerors that time was uh, not a military weapon. It was not guns or it was not swords or anything like that. It was a disease which they were carrying on their body that is which uh, helped them to win over or conquer these regions without even fighting a battle. So smallpox was the disease which they carried to America and because many of the uh, people in America were cut off from the outside world and they were not uh, being introduced so they, they did not have these things which were developed in their body 
which could resist this the disease but europeans had developed an immunity against these disease uh, against the diseases so therefore these people were not immune to the uh, these kinds of things and that led to the complete devastation of uh, the civilizations there and many people also uh, expeditions were there uh, of the famous city of gold which was entirely made up of gold that is el dorado many people or many expeditions were carried down that uh, there exist a city which is completely made of gold and whoever finds that city will be okay uh, this is a given in our ncert a box that is biological warfare that is john winthrop he said that actually it was god's will that is we carried the smallpox uh, on our bodies and transferred it and without even waging a battle or waging a war the land was conquered which was rightfully ours so all dead of smallpox so as the lord hath cleared our title to what we possess now this is eldorado okay the famous city of uh, gold again this is a just a map and probably so eldorado that is the legendary lost city of gold was a beacon for thousands of explorers now everyone wanted to become rich and uh, people wanted to explore and go to new places and uh, seek those adventures and gold seekers for centuries and it is thought to exist in south america now eldorado again uh, it's a spanish word and the uh, which means gilded man is about uh, south america now how transformation from uh, that is earlier india and china being the center of trade how now europe became the center of trade that is china when it uh, went into an isolation and india was uh, already like later on conquered or colonized by uh, england so poverty hunger crowded cities deadly diseases religious conflicts religious dissenters those who did not want to want to agree with the religious practices were common in 19th century europe so people fled to america to avoid all this by the 18th century plantations uh, worked by slaves captured in africa were growing cotton for and sugar for european markets and from the 15th century china had already restricted overseas contacts and moved into or retreated into isolation now these are the original 13 colon, uh, colonies that you can see in the map this again a figure from the ncert where slaves were kept for auction you can see the children there women and again the slaves here they are all well dressed and okay so that uh, prospective buyers can uh, purchase them now coming on next is the birth of modernism that is the 19th century and three types of movement uh, economists has have found out that that is helped in shaping up this uh, global world that is first is flow of trade that is tra trade flowed between two places F because of that again flow of labor and so people in search of work and flow of money capital also flowed between these places that is uh, a world economy shape uh, takes shapes and flow of trade first of all corn laws and its abolition now as corn laws we know that is uh, the britishers or in britain people were growing corn as such and in britain at the same time growing corn or was becoming expensive for the people there and the food prices were rising and even the population was rising many of the people were moving there was industrialization happening so all of the, uh, these things were happening in england now people wanted that is the farmers or the big land owners wanted the government to abolish or have import duties on the corn which is being imported so that they could sell the corn which they are producing now because of this what happened is the prices or the food prices now went up and when food prices went up it was hampering the industrial production or the people who were working in industries because again they will demand that is the workers now will demand to increase their wages that is how uh, they could support a lifestyle for themselves so again the corn laws were abolished so this is all scenario which happened in england that is first corn laws was implemented for uh, people or landlords who were producing corn and now later on it was abolished because then they realized that to import food is much more cheaper for them than producing it so therefore they started importing food rather than producing it themselves so increase in population led to increase in demand of food in britain 
government restricted import of uh, corn known as corn laws but later abolished it food now could be imported into britain more cheaply and uh, it started uh, produ uh, it was produced in eastern europe america all these places sorry where they created all these things and uh, huge lands which were taken over and people started or people became farmers there so eastern europe russia america and australia lands were cleared for food production railways expanded now even now if you have to produce this you have to bring it to the uh, port or the coastal area and from there there again from uh, coastal areas through ships they would be brought to europe so there was a interconnectedness which was developing between different regions so harbors had to be built now so it's all interdependent see you need food now food has to be produced for a ever growing increasing population now when you are producing food somewhere uh, probably at a place now for that place probably what you have to do is suppose you are produ producing your food here and you have to import it here now there's a sea here and then uh, probably uh, there's a land then you have sea here so first you have to quickly transport the food from here so railway lines were built and then from here through harbors and through ships that is it will be sent there so all these had to be built and again to build these you need workers people and then again you need capital so all things were moving into place homes and settlements had to be built also capital flowed from financial centers such as london and labors traveled from europe to america and australia so that that is what happened here okay okay so moving on uh, to the next thing this my sorry Okay, so capital flowed from financial center that is London, and you can see this. Again, people uh, that is emigrants leaving uh, ship, uh, they are leaving for US because US was again seen as a land of new opportunity. Irish immigrants also. That is how now global agriculture economy developed. So by 1890, a global agriculture economy had taken shape, accompanied by complex changes in labor movements patterns. capital flows ecologies and technology so all this is uh, taking shape and because of the complexity in all these things like it is all happening together a global economy is taking shape accompanied by changes in labor movement that is how labor is moving from one place to another place or patterns capital which is flowing from again one region to another region that is money ecological changes because when people will go and settle a huge population or migrants will go and settle to a new place they'll change the ecology of that place and technology which was again developing food no longer was coming from a nearby village but being produced probably thousands of miles away from uh, some distance uh, distant land and again a proper uh, probably entrepreneur uh, kind of a person that is a farmer who is actually a businessman is producing that for you nearby village or town but from thousands of miles away food was transported again by railway and new harbors were built to ship the new cargoes low paid workers migrated in search of new life better life and opportunities from southern europe asia africa and the caribbean so between 1820 and 1914 world trade estimated to have multiplied 25 to 40 times so world world trade what what was happening between 1820 and 1914 multiplied 40 times 60% of this trade comprise the primary products that is the primary things which were coming now even in india canal colonies were developed that is in areas where uh, britishers actually provided irrigation and asked people to settle there and so that agriculture could be practiced there irrigation canals were built in the west punjab to transfer transform desert lands into agriculture lands okay moving on to the next one now role of technology that is flow of trade now technological advances as we know uh, different uh, refrigerated fish uh, uh, sorry refrigerated ships uh, for carrying the meat in europe was an example of technological reform advances and important inventions transformed 19th century world railways steamships had developed and the telegraph triggered economic growth because now things are moving much more faster and this is also uh, similar things you have seen in your chapter from economics that is globalization right so there also these uh, are important factors which determine or helped in the rise of globalization or how globalization has become what it is 
because of uh, changing patterns in your IT, communication that is technology as well as movement. So, railways, steamships and the telegraph triggered economic growth. Colonization again stimulated new investment. So, as colonization happened, new investment were made and improvement were done in transport technology as well in of those areas. Till the 1870s, animals were being shipped uh, alive or live from America to Europe and that is why the meat prices always remained high and out of the reach of the poor people. Now, what happened was when this idea of refrigerated ships came, these animals were slaughtered in America or New Zealand or Australia from where they were being uh, transported to Europe and now because they were slaughtered, they occupied less space and there was also uh, no problem of uh, getting them diseases or uh, uh, if people in Europe probably were uh, not able to eat them. So, all these things were also minimized because of that, right. So, 1870 animals were shipped live from America to Europe and then slaughter, slaughtered when they arrived there. Live animals covered a lot of space, this was again one problem, fell ill and became unfit to eat. Now, refrigerated ships actually helped to transport the perishable food items, that is you can store them for a longer period. Now, animals were slaughtered and for food at the starting point that is either America, Australia or New Zealand and transported to Europe as frozen meat. Now, as frozen meat was being in introduced, now people in England or in Europe started to eat better. A uh, diet which is varied, having uh, different, they could have egg, they could have butter, they could have meat, uh, the people who could afford it. So now, uh, it was not just uh, a simple potato that they are, they are eating, they have uh, different uh, or they have choices for a diet and that is also cheaply available to them, it is not that costly. So therefore, when people are satisfied in your own country, that is how then imperialism happens, that is you want to conquer other places as well. That is what it moves to. So, late 19th century colonialism, that is darker side of colonialism in many parts of the world. See, for a person or for a, a country which is actually the owner or which who has occupied a, another country will always be happy because they are extracting resources according to their wish. But the country which is being colonized will never be happy. So, these are the darker side or uh, two sides of the story of the coin. In many parts of the world, the expansion of trade and a closer relationship of trade and a closer relationship with the world economy also meant of loss of freedom for of these people who are being colonized and livelihoods. Paper partition of Africa that again we have seen that how uh, simply partition was done in uh, the year 1885. Big European powers met in Berlin in 1885 to compete the carving up of Africa okay, in between them. Britain, France and Germany and Belgium became new colonial powers that is uh, occupied more territories, Germany and Belgium, Britain and France were already colonial powers and the US and also, also became a colonial power occupying uh, or taking over some of the colonies which were earlier held by Spain. Now, this is the map of that, okay. so this ha has been divided, you can see uh, I guess the paper partition uh, probably here you can see, somewhere here you can see all these uh, almost straight lines how they have been divided. Right, and even uh, there was a topic which we uh, covered probably in class 9th, if you remember, forest uh, society in that also, uh, sorry, uh, pastoralist in the modern world in that also you remember about how the Maasai tribe was divided, okay. That is one group of Maasais uh, had to go in Tanzania and the other one was left in Kenya. So, that is what happened with those people also, alright. So, that is what you can see. And now this also you can uh, see right now, uh, we will be referring to this uh, area that is Eritrea, Ethiopia okay, and where Rinderpest a topic which will be coming and that time this area will be in focus. So, probably you can see this is Sir Henry, Henry Morton Stanley, uh, Stanley who was given a uh, thing to uh, look out for a person and explorations uh, uh, were happening about a distant uh, new land which was being discovered and it was being mapped with the help of these local people, local tribes. Now, that uh, rinder pest or the cattle plague. Now, actually in Africa, people were quite satisfied, abundance of land okay, and very few population. So, they were quite content and satisfied. 
Now, when the Europeans they reached Africa, they faced a problem. Resources were available in plenty, but the they, no one was willing to work. Why? Because they were they are already satisfied with what they have. Now, to in order to make people work, uh, people need something extra which they are not getting. Then only a person will start working. Now, here also for these colonizers, a boom probably or a boon uh, you can say happened in the form of rinderpest or a cattle plague. Now, because uh, Africa had huge cattle population, so most of the people that is the tribes were dependent on their cattle. But now, because of this cattle plague, which entered from the east coast of uh, Africa and then spread to the western coast and then finally reaching the uh, tip of the that is the southern tip in Africa destroyed ma uh, majority of the cattle there. Now, when the cattle was de uh, destroyed, these African people did not have uh, anything to do. So, now they were being forced to work for these European people. So, Africa had abundant land and a relatively small population. For centuries, land and livestock sustained African livelihoods and people rarely worked for uh, a wage. So, in 19th century, Europeans were attracted to Africa because of its vast natural resources. But the colonizers, they faced an unexpected problem that is a shortage of labor. No one is willing to work for wages. Now, even uh, they tried heavy taxes uh, they imposed so that people uh, start working. In inheritance laws were changed. Okay, that is only one person in the family will be uh, will get the right to inherit inheritance. That is only one son, and rest of the sons had to now because they had to pay taxes. They had to work for living. They could not have their ownership on that. Rinderpest, a fast spreading disease of cattle, had an impact on local economy and livelihood in Africa. The disease killed 90 percent of the cattle population, which destroyed African livelihoods. Now peasants were pushed again into the labor markets. And rinderpest arrived in Africa in late 1880s and was carried by the infected cattle, which was imported by the British Asia to feed Italian soldiers invading Eritrea in East Africa. Italian soldiers who are invading Eritrea in East Africa uh, wanted uh, or were having this meat, which is coming from British Asia. Okay, so. This completely uh, complete thing uh, that is what uh, carried the rinderpest in Africa. That is how the disease was spread. I will again show you the map here. This is Eritrea, okay, and that is what uh, they wanted to invade. That is Italians, okay. Now moving on to the next slide. Now indentured labor migration and from India. That is from India. India also many people uh, migrated in search of new opportunities to work in different uh, areas, different uh, plantations and other places. From India, again flow of labor, that is a bonded labor. Who is an indentured labor? He is a bonded labor under contract to work for a specific amount of time uh, for the employer and then later on to pay off his passage uh, as his will to either his own country or his hometown. And again indenture means a legal agreement, contract or document. Now these were uh, again Indian indentured labors in uh, Cocoa plantations in Trinidad. You can see this. All right. Now these are some of the again recruitment how it was done or of these people by agents. Again, agents who were doing these recruitments showed all things which were false or spoke about that that your life will be very good, okay, and you will enjoy your life there. Uh, hardly you have to work there. All these things promises were made by the agents, but actual reality was very different. And many of them were not even told that they have to take a huge voyage by ship to some distant part of the continent or some other continent right other country where they have to work so uh, these agents again were recruited by these people uh, plantation owners and they were working for a commission so they wanted to recruit uh, as many people as one uh, they could so engaged by employers and paid a small commission agents tempted the prospective mi migrants by f giving them false information about the final destination the travel time nature of work and living and uh, working conditions and when these people reached there they found it to be completely opposite all right now if one uh, a person will reach there they they will be shocked and but they cannot do anything so now how will they express their grief or sadness or maybe the anger so that point will come in the next topics okay so this is all shift of population how from india to south africa 
due to shortage of labor and other things. So, how population from these areas is shifting to other places, all right. That is how, how people actually express themselves, their anger. So, new forms of individual and collective self-expression, blending cultural forms old and new. Different cultures were being blended and they emerged into a completely new kind of a culture. So, in Trindad, that is the annual Muharram festival or procession was transformed into a like righteous carnival, which is known as Jose. The protest religion of Rastafarianism uh, is also said to reflect social and cultural links with Indian migrants into the Caribbean. Uh, he is a fam famous reggae singer that is uh, Bob Marley. Rastafari also known as Rastafarianism is an Abrahamic religion that developed in Jamaica during the 1930s classified both as a new religious movement and social movement by uh, scholars of religion. Again one uh, uh, popular expression, expression was chutney music which became popular in Trinidad and Guyana. So, this is Jose uh, kind of a festival which is happening. Okay, and then this is uh, Bob Marley. Okay, even now most of the people uh, in West Indies team, if you would have seen, have uh, names which are uh, sounding quite similar to Indian names. So these are actually people whose forefathers probably migrated and settled down in these Caribbean islands and probably continue to stay there. Like names like Shiv Narayan Chandrapal or Ram Naresh Sarwan. Okay, for that matter. Okay, so now testimony of an indentured labor which is given. So people from India and China were taken or migrated to other parts of, of the world for jobs, hired under contracts of five years, and living and working conditions were very harsh with very few rights for them. Workers discovered their own way of surviving, that is how to survive all this thing. Okay, and India's nationalist leaders opposed this thing, and later on it was abolished in 1921. And people went from Uttar Pradesh, Bihar or Central India and the dry districts of Tamil Nadu okay, that is uh, to work there and some uh, went from Caribbean islands uh, or where they went that is from where these people were and they went to Caribbean islands mainly Trinidad, Guyana, Suriname, Mauritius, Fiji and Ceylon to work all right. Okay. So now, uh, also Indian entrepreneurs were also developed that is uh, the ones who were providing capital for all this that is flow of capital. So the need of capital uh, with increase in demand of growing food and crops, Shikaripuri shops, Natu uh, Koti Chetiyars were the ones who were financing all this, finance in Central and Southeast Asia. Then also Hyderabadi Sindhi traders uh, established emporias at the emerging port towns at the busy ports worldwide selling local and imported curios to tourists, all right. Now, Indian trade, colonialism and the global system that is uh, again flow of capital and trade both mix that is money inflow, inflow from Britain, money outflow and so inflow of fine cotton, Indian cotton uh, began to decline and British. Now this is we are going a bit in the past that is earlier Indian cotton uh, dominated the world, all right, but later on as uh, India was being colonized slowly and as industrialization happened in Britain, the Indian demand for cotton was facing problems. So began to decline and British manufactured flooded the Indian market as well and Britain again had a trade surplus with India. That is India is importing more from Britain and exporting less to Britain. Britain used this surplus to balance its other uh, deficits, uh, to balance other trade deficits with other countries. Now, Indian textiles faced stiff competition even in other countries, okay, in other international markets where they dominated earlier. Export of cotton that is from India, uh, 30 percent, it was around 1800. Now, these figures are quite alarming that is from 30 percent, it came down to 15 percent and by 1870s, it was just 3 percent in a matter of uh, 70 years, right, okay. Now, this is again the office of East India Company in London from where it was all controlled, uh, its operations, the worldwide operations were controlled, is again uh, from NCRT I guess image. And then what did India export then? If we are not exporting the finished goods, we were exporting actually raw materials and that is what shows uh, that our ex export of raw materials actually increased. The figures again tell a dramatic story, export of raw material increased from 5 percent in 1812 to 35 percent in 1871. 
so that is the earlier which what we were exporting right uh, now that is what we are again uh, as finished goods we were exporting now we are exporting raw materials this is how uh, again the trade routes that is link, uh, linked from different places okay at that time surat you can see a lot of trade was carried from there uh, goa region madras masli patnam hugli here you can see canton muscat and all this okay there is a quick summary about it first is a world economy takes shapes that is the flow of trade then role of technology again is flow of trade late 19th century colonialism is talking about the darker side of colonialism rinder pest or the ca cattle plague is flow of labor at that time indian in entrepreneurs abroad again flow of capital and indian trade colonialism and the global system is flow of capital as well as your trade now coming to the first world war okay first world war as we know was fought in the year 1914 and it lasted for four years till 1918 now many of the countries believed that the war will be over by probably uh, december or within 2 3 months and they will be able to conquer the vast resources of the other countries or nations but actually this didn't happen and the war dragged on till 4 years <coughs> so interwar economy the first world war was mainly fought in europe but its impact was again felt globally why because most of the countries in europe which were fighting the war actually had colonies all over the world it lasted more than 4 years now again some short points of this first modern industrial war it was millions of soldiers were recruited for this almost 9 million dead and 20 million people were injured household incomes declined after the war and industries produce war related goods during this period now this is <coughs> sorry you can see uh, probably the central powers which were for the first world war germany austria hungary bulgaria ottoman empire allied powers uh, who won the war actually the first world war great britain france russia as we know again had left in 1917 uh, serbia italy and the united states which later joined the war now what uh, happened during war time transformations industries restricted to only war uh, making goods which are uh, related to war because to protect one's nation is of utmost uh, utmost important importance that time agriculture production was cut down britain lost dominance in indian market us emerged as the international creditor post war recovery economic boom in india ended led to increase unemployment in india and canada us and australia also became wheat producers at that time eastern europe revived later and created a glut in wheat production that is see now these countries started producing wheat because in europe europe needed supplies of food and it was in war so earlier when uh, from eastern europe the wheat or food was supplied in europe but now what happened because of war all these things are being blocked so to meet there's a new market and which is demanding or uh, which has still uh, demand so these countries started producing wheat and now when after the war everything was fine again the eastern europe's production resumed it created a huge glut in the food market that is in the wheat production there was actually over production so when there is over production and demand is same supplies more than the demand prices will fall so rise of mass production and consumption uh, by probably henry ford right yeah so in the us recovery was much quicker war helped boost the us economy the concept of mass production was introduced by henry ford and at first the workers at ford fa factory were una unable to cope with the stress which it generated of working on assembly lines and assembly line he uh, took it from the chicago slaughter house where uh, a person is ex expected to do only single task and if he is doing a single task repeatedly probably his efficiency will increase and also it was con controlled by an assembly line line so that uh, each person has to do his work before the other person could ta uh, take it over so there will be no chance that a person could even for a second turn his face away from the work or have a friendly chat with the neighbor so on assembly lines four double the daily wage because of this st stress what uh, many people left uh, the work so what uh, henry ford did was he doubled the wages 
and banned all the trade unions in his factory. And this he says that was the best cost cutting uh, thing which he had done. So, car production in US rose from 2 million in 1919 to more than 5 million in 1929. Housing and consumer things were being sold on easy loans that is nowadays what we call EMIs. Consumer boom of 1920s created the basis of prosperity in the US. <coughs> but again, this was just short lived. A great depression came in. Now, causes include agriculture overproduction which was happening because now farmers to at least get, get that minimum are producing even more so that at least they could level or balance their prices which led to overproduction and again the demand fell. Overseas loans which were there, hike in US import duty, rapid fall in prices, these are all short points related to the Great Depression and decline of production happened rise in unemployment, people are not, are not having employment, so probably they will not be able to spend also. And finally, the complete US banking system collapsed. So, this is uh, what led to Great Depression and now how India was affected by Great Depression that is immediately affect Indian, affected Indian trade, prices in India too plunged, peasants and farmers were the worst hit, but people who had a, a steady job or people who are work uh, in staying in cities or who are house owners and all, they were not that affected by this because they had a regular source of income which they were getting. Now, moving on to the second world war that is uh, it happened from 1st September 1939 to 2nd September 1945. The second world war broke out a mere two decades just after uh, the first world war. League of Nations uh, was formed so that nations could would not go to war after that after the what horrors they had seen during the first world war. But as we all know that uh, still second world war happened and it was a war waged for 6 years on many fronts. In many places over land, on sea, in air, 3 percent of the world's total population died during this. Okay, allies were Britain, France, Soviet Union and the US now, Nazi Germany, Japan and Italy. So, Axis powers and allied powers, here also allied powers defeated the Axis powers. This is Stalingrad in Soviet uh, Russia that was devastated by the war, now this is Volgograd, uh, the new name. Rebuilding a world economy that is after the war again how the post war era that is how economies were built. The two influences which uh, we could see after the world war was emergence of UN, uh, US sorry, yeah UN was also made after the second world war, US emergence as the dominant power and the second one is dominance of the Soviet Union. So, these two power blocks emerged and that is what led to the uh, period of cold war till uh, finally, the Soviet Union uh, was no longer there. Okay, so, uh, post war settlement then, importance given to economic stability that is what control over full employment that is only uh, mass production could be uh, sustained if only there is also full employment. Okay, that is uh, if you are producing, people should be able to buy it also, otherwise, it will crumble down. Okay, you will produce more and more and nobody is buying, so finally prices will fall down, you have overproduction. So, people need to buy that also, for that they need to be employed. So, Bretton Woods conference was held in 1944 and with it there was an emergence of international monetary fund, one organization IMF and the World Bank which is also known as the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, emerged to finance post war reconstruction like how countries will come together and how post war recovery could be done. So, this is the place where it was done, the conference took place, Bretton Woods. So, early post war years, era of unprecedented go growth of trade and incomes for the western industrial nations and Japan okay, and worldwide spread of technology as well as enterprise. Now, decolonization also after that many of the colonies could no longer hold on to their uh, empires and finally, many of the nations became independent. So, Bretton Wood institutions moved their attention from these western world or western countries and Japan to the other developing countries, but they were uh, not able or they were not prepared for the challenges which these developing or the underdeveloped nations had. So, developing countries organized themselves in groups like G77 to demand a new international economic order that is NIEO. So, rise of uh, multinational corporations or MNCs and first MNCs were established in 1920s that is how 
globalization or how uh, the making of a global world happened from earlier we had seen from silk routes how trade was happening then uh, we came how colonization was happening and then how uh, from europe people were moving to america or in search of new lands settling there migration was happening flow of trade capital as well as people so all that then uh, coming more uh, the role of india in that and then further moving that is the two wars and the rebuilding of the economies and the present scenario which we are in first mncs were established in 1920s worldwide spread of mncs was a notable feature of the 1950s and 60s first is international monetary fund that we saw world bank stabilize exchange rate external surplus and deficits of the countries headquarters in washington dc both have headquarters in washington dc these are the symbols all right so thank you so much for watching this one shot video i hope you liked it okay